students. Excellent. So we are recording. So uh, just in case anybody's wondering. So Denise, why don't you tell us just a little bit about you and what you do, and then we'll have some questions as we go through the, the morning. Absolutely. Um, do you just want me to kind of go through the, the career questions or would you like to just ask me and it's first start completely off? completely up to you. You can start and then if I think you've missed something, I'll ask you questions. If you'd prefer I ask you questions, I'll ask you questions. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I love to gab, gab anyway. So first off, my name is Denise Waters. Um, I work at the Halifax Shipyard. Um, I am a little bit more mature. Uh, I started this career when I was 38. Um, I was in the tourism industry a long time ago, uh, for almost 20 years. Um, I have four children and was a single mom. So by the time I got to this, I have twins, my this third set, I should say, like I have two girls and then a set of twins. So when I was on my third pregnancy, I was like, the tourism industry is not for me. It's long hours, long nights, that type of thing. What am I going to do? Um, so I actually followed one of my best friends who is a female as well. She joined Women Unlimited, which is through NSCC. And um, she then proceeded to go through welding for her first year. And I watched her and I was working for um, the Fairmont Hotels. Um, great industry to be in if you like that industry. I loved it. I, I'm very social, love to be with people, but it was, and I, but I also like to work with my hands and do things. So I was like, I was watching her and she was doing all these cool things. And I'm like, I could do that. So, in 2015, I actually went through Women Unlimited. So for any ladies out there, um, there's opportunities as well for you to go through programs to get you into the trade. So what Women's Unlimited was, was a 14 week exploration program, which touched on all the trades, construction, electric, electrician, plumbing, all of that to see where you would like to be if you wanted to be in the trades. Um, ours focused on, on um, metal fabrication and welding seeing that Irving, the service of excellence we have at NSCC, they jumped on board with us and they wanted welders and um, metal fabricators. I, I fell in love with being a welder. It, to me, it was easy, um, not easy work. You still have to work hard, but it was something that I love to do. I love working with my hands, building things. And then it was like, wow, I can, I can, I'm melting two pieces of metal together. But at the end of the day, we built a ship that went in the water. Um, so I did do Women's Unlimited the 14 weeks and then that September that finished just before summer and that September I enrolled into NSCC um, to do the welding program. That is a two year program. Um, first year was a little overwhelming because I was then mature and I hadn't been in school in probably 15 plus years and I was very scared. but. NSCC is a wonderful school. There's lots of opportunities for people for with disabilities, people who just need extra tutoring, extra help. So all of those um, were there. I actually was the president of the uh, student association there. So I brought a lot of stuff to the school for the students. Um, so when I was there for the first year, like I said, it is a little overwhelming because you're coming into a career that is brand new. So you're learning something that you've never touched before. But for me, I liked it because it was half the morning was our theory, but the rest of the day we were actually in the shop. So we were actually building stuff from pretty much the first month on. Um, and that's what was pretty cool because you can, your imagination, you can do anything you want. They'll, they'll, they'll help you do anything you want. I built like a four by four trailer and then I bought, I did picture frames. We did rows. I did everything just because I want like, you know, just to touch base with everything. Um, what else There's bursaries when you go through, um, school as well. So that can help you get through it. Um, and then once I graduated, Irving presented us with uh, an opportunity for employment. So I joined them in 2017. So I've been there for almost five years now. Um, I absolutely love it. I just, I did two years and then went back to school to do my red seal and I just got my red seal which uh, it was in February of last year. Yes, that is such, that is the hardest thing you can do when you become a welder or any try to, to trade, sorry. Um, when you get your red seal, you are pretty much finished the education part. <laughs> so I did do that and I got my certificate last year. Um, so, and then when you become red seal, you're pretty much your pay raise doubles. Um, so when I came out of school and started with Irving, usually a welder, 
not so much with Irving, but around $20. I started at 23 something at Irving. Um, and as you go, you, you, you progress a little bit with your pay, but once you hit your red seal, um, which you can do in pretty much two years, um, it went up to 38. So yeah, now I make 38 something an hour. Um, loving it. Um, but the more you make it, the more you spend, I guess as well. But that kind of pushed me into the welding career as well, because I had four children on my own. So that was the path that I took. Um, what else would you like to know? Well, I'm kind of wondering like, what does a typical work day look like? Sure. So down at the shipyard, we have three shifts. We have the morning shift, which will be a seven Right now it's COVID hours, so we some start at seven, some start at seven thirty, goes to three thirty or four. Then we have the four thirty five come in, they go to eleven eleven thirty. Then we have the back shift. Um, so I I'm the day shift. I go Monday to Friday. I can do weekends. That's overtime, and you can also have opportunities to do overtime early morning or later at night as well. And that when you do overtime at Irving, it's double the money. So I'm getting. Yeah, I'm getting paid <laughs> 70 something dollars an hour if I want to work on a Saturday. Um, wow. Yeah. Maybe so I, I should check in. A at, I work at 7 30. Um, so we, we scan in with a crew. So I have a crew of about 30 people. Um, if you've ever, I'm not sure if anybody has seen the shipyard building, um, it is over four football fields long. Um, an actual ship can be built in there. We And I'll tell you how that's done through, through our day too. So when we, check in we have sections where we check in um, we scan our badges and then our supervisor will give us the job for the day we they're usually huge units um, so there could be 30 40 of us on one unit at a time all working and we have our break of course in the morning then we have our lunch and we go to about 3 30. I said you have the opportunity to do overtime so if there is that opportunity jump on it because um, you make a lot more money um, so in the shipyard, when you build a ship, and I, I put up on everybody's um, message, just Ships for Canada, our, our website on Irving. Anybody can go onto the Irving Shipbuilding website and you can see our progression. But the reason I put it up there is so that you can show the students, on, it shows you a little bit how a ship is actually built. So we basically get metal in um, an assembly hall and it's like a box of Lego. So pallets and pallets of metal come in. It's like a, you open a box of Lego and there's bag one, bag two, bag three, bag four. So they're they're called mega block. Like we build a mega block out of that. So we'll put the first bag together and build this unit. The second bag together, we'll build a second unit and so on and so forth. And then we then put them all together. While we're putting them all together, remind you there's electricians on there. There's plumbers on there. There's welders on there. There's all engineers on there, all these pipes going through and everything else. But if you see that, that anybody can go onto the website. You, if you see, you'll see the progression and how it actually stacks up because it starts from literally this small piece of metal and it ends up to be a ship. I'm so proud to say that I build ships for Canada um, and they, they're floating. They're, they're in the water now. We have two in the water now. So it's very, like, I'm very proud to say that I actually all the ships, my name somewhere is on that. I put my hands on it. So, yeah. And throughout the day, so I'm a welder. So basically, if you don't know what a welder is, um, it's kind of hard to explain without seeing it, but I melt melt two pieces of metal together and form some type of structure. I'm a structure welder as well. Um, so that's pretty much what I do all day. They give me a job. Um, you're going to build this or weld these walls together. They're called bulkheads. You're going to... And I just welt all day long. Um, yeah. What do you and think then, is the most challenging part of the job? It's a dirty job. So get be prepared to get dirty. Um, and also confined spaces. There's some small areas that you're going to get into um, that are difficult physically on your body. You may be hung upside down welding the side of the ship because, yeah, and it's, I'm serious when I say that. Um, you could be like in a really, really small hole that you have to really stick your body in there. Plus you're playing with fire. Um, so it's a dangerous job. We have gases. We have a lot of things that go on. So it can be dangerous, but we're very safe. All of the tradespeople at the shipyard, we're pretty much a team, a family. So we look out for one another as well. 
Um, but yeah, it's it's physical, so be be prepared to to get into some tight spots and using your muscles and climbing ladders and that type of stuff. Excellent. I mean, you've talked a little bit about the whole work life balance. So how is that working for you with having four kids and working full time in a, a a male dominated industry? Absolutely. Um, so about probably 15 years ago, there was maybe five women in the shipyard. Today we have over a hundred. We're moving on up. Yeah. And Irving is really on our side with that. So for the women out there, if you're looking to get into the trades, Irving is on our side and they actually love us and I, nothing against the gentlemen out there. Um, we just are a little bit more particular when, when we, that this is what they say that we are a little bit more particular and a little bit more detail orientated. So, uh, they, they actually put prefer women on certain jobs because they take their time. They have the patience. I'm, I'm not saying the men don't because we have wonderful men down at the shipyard as well that teach me every single day that I'm there. Um, so yeah, from being in a male dominated world, the men didn't like us probably a few years ago when we were coming in the door, didn't think we could do it, but now really they motivate us, they teach us, they show us everything. Um, they're, they are there to help us because guess what? These, the, the older gentlemen that were there, they're almost out. So they have to teach us, they have to show us, and we just keep pushing it down the line. So a very good opportunity at Irving. Yeah. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. That's because I have my microphone. <laughs> um, <laughs> how much has COVID affected, you know, your day to day at the end and, and the industry itself? Um, for us, we tried our best to keep open. Um, last year when COVID first hit, we did shut down. There was a, a case that came into the yard and we have about 1,400 tradespeople just in the building, in ship repair, and in the water um, on the ship. Um, so we're very close. Then we also have another 1,000 in the offices. So there's a lot of it. We're like a small community just down at the shipyard, and we come from everywhere, from the Valley, Dartmouth, Halifax, you know, wherever. Um, so we were, they had to put a lot of protocols, safety protocols in place. Um, we still wear our masks and all of that today, do social distancing, even though that sometimes, like I said, there's 20 people on the unit, we have to go in a different section. We spread out, we do the best that we can. Um, Irving has put in place for our tools. So when they get returned, you know, they get, uh, wiped down and things like that because we borrow them. Um, we have, they did in the beginning have the temperatures and the, the rapid COVID tested at the, at the site. Um, everything has been calmed down now and everybody's doing their vaccinations and they record it all. So it, it's getting better, but there's always that scare because we let subcontractors in too. And, you know, we have to be aware of them and where they, where they have been as well. But for the, for the most part, it's, it, they've put the, the safety precautions in place. And you can only do what you can do, right? Like we we all wash our hands, we all wear our masks, we do we try our best to stay six feet or at least have our masks on. So excellent. I'm gonna open it up to questions. If anybody has any questions, the teacher can either turn on their microphone or we can put them in the uh, the chat and we can see if we've got some questions for Denise. I know her name doesn't say Denise, but again, that's because her <laughs> her student her children use the computer too <laughs> yeah i'm sorry i don't check all this stuff out before i start it's all good it's all good so i guess a question i know a number of years ago there was a lot of demand for welders um especially when irving had been awarded this contract but what's the demand like now for welders is it still a big demand Absolutely. So in the next um, year, they expect to hire another pretty much thousand people, most of them being welders. We, if So right now, if uh, you became a welder in the next couple of years, you still have a career for probably 25 years. Um, Irving is going to have work for another at least 25 years. Right now we are on the AOP ships, which is the offshore patrol ships. We have two that have been built and given to the customers. We have the third one that is in the water. The fourth and the fifth are in our ultra hall right now and assembly hall being built. So that alone 
is another five to 10 years. Uh, but within those five to 10 years as well, we'll be doing our combatant ships, which are our, our Navy patrol ships that basically protect our borders. Um, so we have worked for welders for an, an easy 25 years. That is so one question in the chat. So students want to know how long a shift project might take from start to finish. Okay, um, so when you do anything, you learn from the first one and fix your mistakes as you go. So our first ship did take five to almost seven years to be totally finished and given to our customer. Um, that was coming from new plans that we had we had received, Irving received on how to build the ship and how what we were going to do. We had changed things as well along the way to make it better for us. Um, a lot of the times we build the ship upside down and then we flip it. Um, so we had to, yeah, so we had to make a lot of different changes. So the first one did take a very long time, but we learned, of course, from our mistakes. So the second one then took probably three years down to two, we are within, we're now building ship five and we're still in the seventh, eighth year, if you understand what I mean. So within, we started this, the second and the third within those seven years, but to actually from start to finish for one, it took the first seven years for the first one, but we're now down to approximately two to maybe three years. But by the time we get, we get to the fifth, um, we're probably down to maybe a year, year and a half. We're like, we are boogieing right now. We were on ship three and now we're on five. Like we're, we're boogieing right now down there. Lots of work. Excellent. So um, New Germany Rural High is wondering what are some of the key requirements or skills and abilities needed to go into this career? Okay. So uh, like I said, I, I was a single mom of four. Well, I, at the time two, until I went back to school with Ed and Tourism. When I hit welding, I had four children. I had no skills other than I like to work with my hands. I mean, I like to build things. I'll put things together, the furniture, all of that stuff. So I, was, I can do this. You just have to learn it. But I, had, I didn't even know what a welder was before I started this process. So you don't need to have any actual skills to start it or abilities to start it. You just have to like doing things, building things, doing stuff with your hands, but be prepared to be dirty as well. Um, so when I started at NSCC, I knew nothing. They give you all of the techniques. They teach you everything you need to know. They, you are literally hands on with the teachers every single day. So that's how you learn. Um, the, the theory is it teaches you what it is and how to do it. But in, until you do it with your hands, um, that's actually how you actually learn and get better. And it's by practice only. So you really don't need anything. There's nothing that you need to pre-study for or have to, to get into this career at all. Excellent. So I think that's all of our questions. Um, do take a look at the um, uh, video if you have a chance, maybe play it over our break. It's about a two minute video. So it's not a long video, but it's pretty cool just to watch them put that ship together. Um, and see where they're at. So um, the, uh, the, the link is in the chat toward the top if you want to go up and get that. And if anybody has any questions that they think of afterwards, you can always put them in the chat and we will make sure that Denise gets them and answers them for us. But thank you so much, Denise. I think, I think it's an amazing career. And I know I listened to you last year and was blown away last year. And uh, this year it's, even the more exciting. You've got your it's just getting more exciting off. because there's more ships being built. And now we're getting closer to the big combatant ships, which are the huge ones. I don't even know how they're going to fit in our building, but we're moving <laughs> right along. And I, it's so exciting. I can't, it is hard work. It's dirty work. But if you love what, what you do, and I love going to work, the people are amazing. I can't stress enough that it's, and, and you're independent. It's not like you have somebody watching over you either. So it's, you're just building and you're doing something you love and getting paid good money for it. I can't stress enough. If you like doing things with your hands and building stuff, get into the trades and it doesn't have to be welding, but you know, I'm, I'm a welder. So I'm, I'm out there <laughs> cheering for all the welders, <laughs> but Excellent. thank you so much well, as well, everybody. Thank you um, so much. Yes. Have a great day. Okay, thank you. Take care. All right, bye-bye.
Okay, everyone, we're back. We've got a few people joining us, so I'm hoping they can hear us. Um, if they can't, just let us know in chat if you can't hear us. <coughs> Excuse me. We're so excited to get started with our second mentor this morning. This is Joey, and is it Poirier? Am I saying that right? Poirier, yeah. Poirier, excellent. And Joey has his own construction company, so he ha he is a business owner. So, Joey, do you want to tell us just a little bit about yourself? Sure. And your position? Yeah. Um, so, as said, my name is Joey, and uh, I'm the owner-operator of Joey Poirier Construction in Shetty Camp in Cape Breton. Um, I am a Red Seal Carpenter by trade. Um, I've been working in the trade for almost 20 years now. Um, I apologize if it seems like I'm reading. It's because I am. I put together this presentation, but I haven't had a I haven't had time to go over it a whole lot. So um, bear with me. Um, first of all, I, I'm I'm really happy that I was asked to do this because uh, I do have a passion to inspire young people to become successful and do what they love to do, do what they want to do. So I'm happy to be here. <clears throat> so today I'm going to talk a little bit about the carpentry trade and a little bit about my journey and um, what I did to get to where I am today. So when I graduated high school, I honestly didn't have much of a clue what I wanted to do at that time. Um, my cousin had graduated a year before me and was in a protective security course in Truro. So it seemed kind of interesting to me. So I figured I would follow one of his footsteps and give that a try. Uh, quickly realized that wasn't for me though. After a short stint in, in Truro, I, I moved back home and I had the opportunity to sign up for a series of workshops um, where they presented a number of careers to you. It was paid workshops for about five weeks or so, and they presented a bunch of careers. And after seeing the presentation on carpentry, I decided that that seemed pretty interesting and I'd give that a try. So I signed up for the apprenticeship program through NSCC and I went to work for a local contractor. Um, it took me about five years to get all my hours and to complete all the blocks to get my red seal. Back then, I think we needed 2,000 hours per block for a total of 8,000 hours. Um, now, I believe they scaled it back to about 1,800 hours per block for a total of 7,200 hours. So about six years ago, I decided to start my own construction business. Um, <clears throat> I'm not entirely sure what made me choose this career in the beginning, but I can tell you what I like about it now. Um, I like that we're helping people. People need a, a home to keep them safe, warm and dry. Uh, people come to us when their roof needs repairs, for example. Uh, we replace their shingles and give them a new roof, thus helping them stay dry and preventing further damage to their home. Uh, another example could be when someone brings me a set of plans, it could be for a new home, uh, possibly their dream home or in addition to their existing home, maybe to suit their growing family. Whatever the case may be, they bring me the plans and we build it for them, thus delivering them their desired or needed space of their dreams. <clears throat> Besides doing work on other people's homes, I've, I've also purchased a couple of abandoned properties for myself and completely renovated them to keep them and turn into rental units. I absolutely love taking an abandoned building or an old building and restoring it and giving it new life and making it better than it ever was. Um, that's probably one of my favorite things about the trade. It's also nice and rewarding when you get positive feedback from neighbors, happy to see the eyesore of the neighborhood um, finally getting fixed up or getting calls or messages from people with ties to the property, happy to see it being restored instead of torn, torn down. Um, 
in terms of additional training or experience beneficial to succeeding in your trade, I would say this. Whatever your field of choice is, learn as much as you can about it. Um, never stop learning. Strive to be the best. The more you can learn, the more you can do, the more value you bring, the more money you will, you will earn. Like in construction, for example, um, if I have a house that I need to build, well, who on the site do you think is being paid the most? The lead person, obviously, the one that knows how to get things done and can manage the site and the people working under him or her. So as an apprentice starting out, you want to be eager to learn as much as you can from these people who are more experienced. You want to also learn from the best in your field. For me in construction, in the construction industry, for example, it's following and learning from people like Brian Balmer, Mike Holmes, Scott McGilvery. Um, I want to be the best, therefore I surround myself with the best. Um, if anybody knows who Brian Balmer is, he's on HGTV, he's had TV shows like Disaster DIY and uh, Island of Brian and House of Brian. He actually has a program much like the Better Business Bureau. It's called Bomber Approved. Um, you have to qualify to be in that program. You have to submit references of people that you've done work for. You have to submit references of people that you work with in the trade, like sub trades or whatever. You have to maintain your insurance. You have to maintain your licenses, all this kind of stuff. I'm very proud to say that my company is Bomber Approved as well as we are also in the Better Business Bureau. Um, we're also with the Canadian Home Builders Association. Like we're, we're well um, licensed, qualified company, I guess I should say. Joey, can I ask a question? I'm just kind of wondering, you talked about making the money and I know I've been, I've had a number of carpenters here lately and I think the Red Seal, but they're making about $35 an hour. That's what I'm paying them. Is that kind of what they can expect once they're Red Seal? What do you see in the industry for pay? So it, it kind of depends on the market you're in. It can also depend on whether or not, like we're a residential company. So you're not going to make the same amount of money hourly wise working for a company like myself in re doing residential work as you might if you're working in a, in a union job, for example, union gets paid, paid more, but their commercial work. Um, I never did like commercial work. I was in the carpenters union before I never worked an hour for them. Um, I like what we do. I like residential work <clears throat> and I have guys on my staff that have been in the union themselves too. And they actually prefer working for me as well. I think because we're more steady, I think. Like when you're in a union, you, you can you can work on a big job, but then you might have a little downtime between jobs where we're pretty well year round. Like there's not a whole lot of downtime. So it's a little bit less hourly, but probably works out to about the same, or I feel you might even make more. Like if you're qualified for me, like my top guys, for example, make 28 bucks an hour currently. Plus, we get we have a benefits package, so they get the dental and medical and all this kind of stuff as well, right? So it's yeah, that's excellent. And uh, yeah, so I I feel it's a rewarding financially and and all that kind of stuff too. Um, and and I'll speak more about that in the next this next section, which I'm trying to address the questions that were on the the paper, like. Oh, okay, excellent. I'll let you do your thing. <laughs> what's what's a typical work they look like at Joy Power Construction? Well, for the crew members, um, their work day starts at 8 a.m. typically and ends at 4.30 with a half, half hour lunch break at noon and a 15 minute break at 10 and again at 3. Um, they get the seven statutory holidays off with pay. Um, for me as the business owner, things are a little bit different. There's not really any typical. 
each day brings some new challenges and hurdles to jump over and navigate around. <clears throat> my day starts at 5.30 in the morning with a coffee in my office, going through emails, working on estimates, invoicing, promoting on social media, organizing paperwork for my bookkeeper, and so on. 8 to 4.30, I'm usually out in the field managing and keeping things organized on all four to five sites we have going on at the same time. Running for materials, tools, dealing with staff, client questions, as well as inspectors and so on. Most days I eat my lunch on the go. Um, after hours, I sometimes have one to two meetings scheduled with potential new clients or existing customers. Sometimes I'll be working on estimates or office work in the evening as well. My weekends bring more of the same. I do like to watch my nieces play hockey on the weekends, but that doesn't mean that I get to take the whole days off. I'm still in my office at 5.30 in the mornings. I might be on a job site from 8 to 11.30, for example, cleaning up, organizing, or doing some sort of work. Then drive to Port Hood to watch a game that starts at 1 and ends at 2.30. And then drive back and be back here for 4 and doing some more work, office work. Or... When you have 15 or more employees, depending, you know, depending on you for a paycheck, you need to be committed to the business and to keeping things running as smooth as possible. Um, that being said, so, so entrepreneurship and business ownership to, to this scale is not for everybody. Um, it's a huge commitment, but you can, if I, if I would have had somewhere to work, like I think I provide, back when I may not have started my own because you can be committed and give a hundred percent and be rewarded if the right environment is there. Like if you're working in an environment or working for a boss, that's not going to be, um, good or rewarding or whatever, then you're, you're probably not going to want to commit as much. I provide the opportunity that if you want to commit to my company and you want to do the best you can and you can work more hours and the, the, the feeling is that the more the, comp the the more the company is going to succeed, the more you're going to be rewarded for it above and beyond already waited. Like we're still, we're only a six year old company. We're still growing. We're still expanding. And I tell my guys, don't look at just your hourly rate. Look at making the company as big as it can be. And I promise you, everybody's gonna re be rewarded in the end. Um, there was a, a question about COVID. Um, COVID has in some way affected everything and everyone. Construction was deemed an essential service and therefore was never shut down through COVID but we were and still are affected in other ways. Um, when it all started, of course, we had to put some protocols and procedures in place. Construction materials took a spike in price while quantities dropped. Um, I'm finding myself having to hit multiple billing supplies, um, all over Cape Breton to gather enough materials to do one job. Uh, that's something we've never experienced before and it certainly makes things more challenging. So to finish up, um, I'd like to say a few things. If, if you do have an interest in this field in carpentry, um, number one, go for it, because I see a huge demand for more carpenters out there. I myself would like to hire more experienced carpenters as well as apprentices to grow my business. So if you're looking for a place to start, don't be shy to give me a shout. I'm not hard to find. I think I have a couple minutes left and I'd also like to speak to not only the trades or, or carpenters. Um, like I said before, I have a passion for harnessing young people's dreams and goals. Um, 
my I would be very disappointed if anyone has a dream or a goal or what they want to do in life to be discouraged by adults, whether it be teachers or parents or whatever. Um, I have lots of examples I could go over. I have one that I wrote down just before I started. Um, Stanley, if anybody knows Stanley, creator of Spider-Man and lots of other things. When Stanley created Spider-Man, he was laughed at. So he didn't give up, he kept going. So don't ever let someone's doubting you allow you to doubt yourself. Does Sidney Crosby have God-given talent? Maybe a little bit. Sidney Crosby is the best hockey player in the world because when other kids were out fooling around, Sidney Crosby was shooting pucks in the basement. Nothing is impossible. Anything is possible if you want to commit. Yeah, absolutely. I, that's so true about so many different things from schooling to personal life to, you know, whatever it is you want to do in life. I totally agree with you, Joey. Um, anybody has any questions? Your teachers are welcome to put your mic on um, or you can type them in the chat and we'll ask Joey any questions that you have. Um, you know, I know here I've been getting carpenters is really tough. There's such a demand for carpenters right now and finding somebody that's available. Most of the carpenters that I know are, are booking into next summer um, and into the fall. So, you know, there's tons of jobs. And um, we do have a question in the chat. Middleton Regional High would like to know, where did you go to school? I went to NSCC in Sydney. In Sydney? Yeah. yeah. And uh, where did you go to high school as well? Oh, and the here in Chetty Camp. And uh, yeah, perfect. Um, fun, fun. I don't know if we have them on this on the call today or not. I don't, I don't think, think so. But school. fun fact, I do see there's a comment from École Rose des Vents. Um, my brother, Ryan Poirier, just moved back home to be the principal here, but he was a teacher and vice principal at École Rose des Vents for years. Oh, yeah. That might have been why they said hello. Maybe they, they recognized your name. So that would be that would be awesome. Yep. Because Coral Zavon joined us today. Um, down from down in the valley. Um, so we've talked about demand. I, I know how much demand there is. Um, and and how do you find it? It's not completely carpentry, but the work life balance as a business owner. How do you find that? It's all in how you take it, I suppose. Um, myself, um, I'm, I don't know the, the term I use, I'm a workaholic in a sense. Um, I just have, a, I just have a vision of what I want to accomplish. And I mean, I, I don't like saying no to work. The work we're booking into, I mean, we still take smaller jobs like all the time, but for big jobs, like I have worked starting now in 2024. Um, That's crazy. Work-life work, work life balance, I mean, I'm always available, like I said, I'm, I, I have nieces that are playing hockey that I like to go watch and I'm, I'm always there for my family. My family's everything to me, um, but they're also why, <clears throat> excuse me, they're also why I work as hard as I do. Like, I want to create something that I want to create a legacy that I can Am I on? be proud of. Yep, Jason. Can you hear me? Uh, we're just finishing up with the other oh, I got mentor, the so right we'll just be a second. <laughs> Joey, we do have one question from Bridgewater Junior High. Actually, they want to know how difficult did you find the schooling for carpentry? Um, I didn't find it too, too bad. I would, there's two ways you can do uh, that, that you can get into carpentry or probably any trade. Um, you can do it the way I did it, which is apprenticeship. So apprenticeship, you do four blocks of, I believe it was five weeks, four or five weeks each in school. And then you put in the hours on the job site. That's my preferred method because I find you learn a lot more on the job site than I do in school anyways, because I'm a hands-on person, right? 
The other way you can do it is you can go to school for two years. So four years. Um, that's not for me. I'm not, like I said, I learn more on the job. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't find it too difficult. Um, okay, excellent. Um, one other question, or two other questions here, both from the same school. How many hours a week are you usually working and how many hours are your employees typically working? I don't know. I know. My employees work 40 to 48, depending on which which guys. Like some guys work 40, some guys work 48. Um, myself, hard to keep track. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, like I'm, a, I'm all over the place. Like we have, I probably have like five teams. So I have five sites going on at the same time. So my time is more spent going from site to site than actually on one job site working physically with the guys. Sometimes yeah. I'll be doing sometimes I'll be doing that, but most times it's um, all over the place managing everything um, and in the office doing the estimates and billings and meeting with clients. So um, I probably if I tracked all my time, I probably work 70 hours a week or something like that. Wow. But I, I, you know, that is kind of the life as an entrepreneur. A lot of the times is you, you know, it's your own business, so you're responsible for everything, and and it, it's success. And of course, when you've got a team of guys um, counting on you to make sure that there's work and that there's money to pay them, um, it certainly is a a rewarding but a lot of work as an entrepreneur. Correct. Yeah. Excellent. Any last questions for Joey before we let him get back to the job site? <laughs> We're taking his time. Thank you so much, Joey, for spending some time with us today. Uh, you know, I know how important the trades are and how short the trades are on workers right now. So I know, you know, hearing about these trades, how much money you can make and just how many job opportunities are out there is amazing. So thank you so much for joining us today. And if anybody has any questions for Joey that we didn't get a chance to, call, um, to do, then we can send them to him and he'll get back to us and we'll get back to you on those. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, you much. so much, Joey. You're free to go. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <I'm so happy. laughs> yeah, Tara's name's up there, but that's okay. I don't know how to change that. that you can't actually. Once you get yeah. into it, you can't. But there's yeah, three Brenda true. Kennys here as well. So we're good. We're good. Yeah. So I'd like to welcome Jason Knickel. Um, he is a mechanic and the uh, co-owner of Lahave Street Auto Clinic in Bridgewater. Jason is my mechanic um, and I've known him for quite a few years. He also used to volunteer with JA, so he's been around a while. So Jason, do you want to tell us just a little bit about yourself and what you do? Or do you want me to just ask you questions? How do you want to do this? Well, let's just roll with it and you just keep me on task here, okay? Uh, I can do that. So tell us a little <laughs> bit about your story to get started. Well, as, as Brenda mentioned, my name is Jason Knickel, and I freaking love my job. Like, I, I, I think I've got the best career I could have ever chose for myself. I've done a lot of things over the years. I've, I've spent a lot of time in, in university and other educational programs. But coming back to the family business and getting involved in the automotive service trade, has really been the best decision I've ever made. I've been involved in the, in the business since it opened up in, in 1989. I was only a young child then, but always had an interest in cars and fixing vehicles and just, you know, working with, with my father, of course. And um, as, as things have progressed, the business has grown. It's gotten more challenging. There's been a lot of new advancements in technology that we're having to deal with. But all in all, uh, I, I couldn't ask for a better a better career path for me. Um, as far well, as I guess the, you didn't really what I was going to say. I guess you didn't really choose it. Then you were born into it. I well, I was born into it, but I did choose it. I did get my mechanical engineering degree at the Royal Military College. I did take a biology degree. I took a business diploma, but at the end of the day. I knew this was always where I wanted to be. So I did have to venture out and, and take some other avenues and career paths. But at the end of the day, in the back of my mind, I always knew that this is where I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. Excellent. So 
what do you, what kind of training or experience has been um, part of your success? Well, really for me, it, it's been mostly on the job training on the automotive repair side um, and actually being involved in the apprenticeship program directly as, as the, the previous presenter mentioned about, you know, you can take the schooling route to get into the automotive trade, or you can go into straight apprenticeship. Okay, so there are the two ways to do that. I chose the second one. I had enough schooling after all my my previous years of, of education, so I did choose the the apprenticeship way to go. Yeah. Excellent. Um, can you talk about what a typical work day or work week week looks like for you? There's no such thing in this trade. Every day is different. Every hour is different. You know, you don't know what's going to come through the door, what type of emergency or what type of problem is going to arise. Um, a lot of times, you know, the most difficult part can be actually determining what the client is trying to tell you, you know, <laughs> call up or stop in with a noise and you're asking for a description and, you know, and then trying to ascertain exactly what it is the, the issue is. Um, but every day is different. That's what that's what makes this trade so unique and so special because you've got a 45 hour work week and every half hour, hour, two hours is something new coming in, something different coming through the doors. You just don't know what you're going to encounter. You, you, you make all the best laid plans in the world, but you never know, you know, what, what's going to, what's going to happen. I mean, there's a meme that you see circulating on Facebook and other platforms, you know, a, a five, a five minute job is one broken bolt away from a day's job. You know, um, you just, you just don't know what you're going to encounter. And every vehicle is different. Every make, model, year is all different. Every every job is different and unique in, in that perspective. So it can be very challenging that way. So a typical work day or work week is impossible to narrow down, but that's what keeps it so exciting. Like every day is different. You know, you're not doing the same repetitive thing over and over again, which is one of the main things that I enjoy about it. Excellent. Um... So what would be the most challenging part then? Well, the most the most challenging part outside of trying to find out what exactly the problem is, um, is, is, is keeping up with all the modern technology, right? Every, every new model year has new technology, new ways of doing the same thing they've always done, but they have to change it. And, and the electrical side of things, I mean, there's no more grease monkeys anymore there's no you know you're not just turning wrenches there's a lot of computer work there's a lot of diagnostic work electrical it can be so challenging that's the most difficult part is when you're getting into, into you know tracing wires and finding a, an electrical fault in a vehicle that has five thousand feet of, of wire in it so it can be it can be very difficult to, to to you know to find those type of really difficult problems but that's what makes it a challenge you know if, if you want to do this trade you have to be up for the challenge you have to accept that responsibility and, and really spend the time and, and get in there and find it and you have to do your research you have to find how these vehicles work to find the problem and like i say every vehicle is different so you can spend a lot of time doing the research just to find you know the the information that you need excellent and what about the pay scale pay scale well of course in any trade you know you're going to have your apprentices and as you move up your pay should should increase as well so a typical apprentice in our area should start out in the 18 to 20 dollar an hour range uh, a, a red seal or or a, a certified uh, service station mechanic you know should be in the 25 to 40 dollar an hour range 40 dollars an hour that sounds really good doesn't it well it's it, it is a good living and at the end of the day, I mentioned this in previous presentations, there's such a shortage of automotive service technicians that, you know, as a business owner now, it's my responsibility to keep the great mechanics I have. And, you know, we need good mechanics. And in the next 10 to 15 years, a Red Seal endorsed mechanic will be able to dictate his salary range and, and he's going to get it or she is going to get it because there's such a shortage. It, it, it is dire how, how much of a shortage there is in the automotive service sector. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
And what would you think about like kind of the work life balance? And not so much for you as as the business owner, because I know you put in a lot more hours than your mechanics do. But mm. for a mechanic, what would their work life balance look like? Well, it's it's an eight to five job, right? So you know, and, and, and a lot of owners do have flexibility to allow for the vacations, for the appointments, for, for, for time off and that, but it is a, a clock in, clock out job. And I think it's going to depend on the individual. I've got some guys that will take problems home with them and come back the next day with it solved because they've done their research at home, but that's not expected. You know, you, you show up at 7.30 and you leave at 5 and what you do with your own time is is your own. So it is a, a you know, stereotypical you know, eight to five, Monday to Friday type of job. Yeah. And what you do with your time after that is up to you. So. <laughs> Excellent. How has COVID affected what you do? I don't, I mean, COVID affected what we all do every day, obviously, but it really didn't have an effect on our daily routine outside of, you know, making sure everything gets sanitized and, and those types of protocols. But the work did not slow. The work did not stop. Automotive services were deemed essential. People still needed their vehicles on the road. Uh, of course, we are seeing some difficulty in the supply chain, like everyone else is at, at this point, getting parts to repair the vehicles. But COVID did not have a negative effect on the on the the business side of it. Like we we were always still busy, no shortage of work. And at the same time, too, when COVID hit, a lot of other garages did decide to shut down and did lay people off. But for, for me personally, we did not. Like, we had the work to to maintain status quo. Yeah. That's, that's, that's excellent because, you know, it did certainly affect a number of them. But you do have to have your car. It is pretty essential to be able to have a car that's working. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Sure. My car didn't move for you know, months, because, you know, I'm usually way over on my oil changes, and <laughs> lately I haven't been. <laughs> well, no, but that, that also created other problems for vehicles that weren't moving, that all of a sudden the brakes are seized after a month of working from home or whatnot. So there was definitely no no shortage of work in our, in our field during COVID. So what advice would you give a student who's interested in this career? Best advice I could give to any student looking at any trade would be to try to get into in, involved in some sort of a, a co-op program where you can actually experience the trade while you're in high school right experience different trades go to the job site see if you like it you know this is the, the automotive service trade has really expanded the the knowledge base you have to have it's it's all computerized and electrical now and it's it, like i say or like i mentioned earlier it's not just turning wrenches anymore there will always be that role but to really succeed, it's a lot more computerized now. There's a laptop at every station. There's multiple scan tools and diagnostic equipment. There's reprogramming computers in cars. There's a lot more to it. It's not just a dirty trade any longer. You know what I mean? It's it's you have to be you have to be able to troubleshoot. And I think the the best piece of advice I could give would be to go and experience it for yourself. I know a lot of uh, schools like Parkview for sure has programs that encourage the co-op aspect of it. And I think that'd be really important because you may think you want to be a carpenter, a plumber or a mechanic and then go spend a week there and be like, yeah, I, I, I don't think I want to do that. You know, you want to yeah, experience everything you can. And if you do have an interest in this trade, please pursue it. I mean, the opportunities are endless. You can work anywhere in Canada, across the province, in the world with this trade because there is such a shortage. Yeah, excellent. We actually have a question in the chat as well. They're wondering how your trade is going to be affected with the increase of electric cars. Well, I, it's actually, that's a really good question. Um, There's actually one of the things that we are focusing on and retooling on. It is going to change how vehicles are repaired. There will be a lot of services that are no longer needed, but there'll be new services that come on board that will have to take place. They are completely different vehicles. I think it's, it is it is the future of transportation. It is where we're going. It's gonna be quite a number of years before we see a 60 to 80% fill rate on the roads in Nova Scotia. I think the ICE will be around for many, many years to come, but the electric vehicles will present a challenge 
in all of the, the new training that the techs are going to have to do and all the new tooling that the shops are going to put up. And the electric vehicles and even a lot of the new ICEs with all the sensors and the adaptive lane assist and all of these sensors and, and the computers that control them, that's where the future lies in this trade. And it is going to be a lot of, of retraining for the guys that are in it and a lot of new really cool uh, courses that, that young techs can take and, and to learn those vehicles. And if there's a young technician that wants to focus on that, he'll be set or he, he or she will be set because that, that is where we are headed for sure. Yeah. yeah. And for those that don't know, ICE is internal combustion engine. Yes, so that's sorry. the type of cars that we're used to. Yeah. And the then gas. If you hear, yeah, a lot of people will say EV for electric cars and ICE for our non-electric cars. So and then you have the, the HEV, the hybrid electric vehicles, which we're seeing a lot more of now. Exactly. And I mean, some of the pieces are always, you're always going to need your tires done. You're always going to need right. brakes done. Um, yeah. But you're not going to need oil changes. You're not going to need no. those types of things. with electric No, there's, for, for the EVs, it's it's coolant changes. Like that, ha that has to be done almost as frequently as oil changes. Oh. So that's going to be a part of it. Um, brakes, there's not really any brakes. I don't know if you've driven an EV, but you just let off in the accelerator and the engine slows you down. So there's not going to be that type of stuff. There'll still be suspension elements to it. Um, and of course, tires and all those types of things, alignments. But it is going to drastically change how, how this industry works in, in the future. But it, it's a great challenge. I'm excited for it. I think it's awesome. It, it's going to be really good. Are you going to have one? Are you going to have an electric car soon, Jason? No, I will not. <laughs> <laughs> you seem to be pretty sure about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, do we have any other questions for Jason? I'm just watching chat. You can either say it um, on the mic or put it in chat, whichever you prefer. I'm just watching the time. Okay, excellent. So I have a couple more questions, though. Um, All right. So what do you i mean other than the challenge and every day is different what do you love about it what do i love about my day love about it helping people you know pe people don't come in to see you just to say hi right they're coming in with a problem they they need to get to work they need to get to hockey practice and their cars broke down and when you can get them back on the road and you're, you're helping them it, it's it's a really good feeling especially you know, when someone's in an emergency or they're traveling, they're trying to go on vacation. And that, that's the best part of my day is when you can look at someone and they're just excited. They're, they're, they're excited to give you money. <laughs> that you is know? good. Um, yeah. We have another question in the chat. What's the worst car you had to fix? Oh, how much time do you have? <laughs> You've got three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, most of the, the the more difficult vehicles to repair are anything kind of European, your BMWs, uh, your Minis, your smart cars, Mercedes, just because they are engineered so differently than the vast majority of the vehicles that we see. Um, diesel technology can be a bit of a challenge. Uh, we had a truck in recently that uh, we had to replace the engine in the truck because he drove too too long with a misfire. And you know, it was a 48 hour job to, to change that engine. You had to lift the whole cab of the truck off to change the engine. So there's, there's all types of, of challenges like that. But the, uh, I don't think there's, there's really a, the worst vehicle, but there's more ve there's vehicles that are more challenging than others. And a lot of it is the imports. Excellent. Couple more questions. How long does it take to make a car? How long does it take to make a car? Well, if you watch it on YouTube, it's like three and a half minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I think to put a to put a vehicle together, they're probably you know these these factories are churning out hundreds a day with those assembly lines, right? It's it's just they put again they put them together pretty quick. But I would imagine start to finish with paint and everything, you'd probably be looking at four to five days yeah. in the factory to put it together properly. Yeah. And then um, another one would just like to be reminded how many years of school does it need, do you need after high school to become a mechanic? Well, there's just, if you, if you decide to take the program at NSCC, it's one year of schooling, 
But when you take your blocks, which is your, you know, you, you do your hours as the apprenticeship and then you go back to school for, they made it two months now for automotive, but you're looking at four to five years to complete, to, to go from high school to a Red Seal endorsed mechanic is about five years. So five years. And that's so many hours on the job, I, maybe 1800 hours it, on the job. It's, it's every 2000 hours on the job. Okay. You can go do your next block. So by the time you're said and done, it's about 8,000 working hours. Yeah. And for most people, about 2,000 hours is approximately a year full-time. That's right. Right. Yeah. So about right. four years. And it depends how fast you get through your blocks. And if you pass your test, you know, there's a lot of other variables there as well. But typically yep. four to five years. Four or five years. Excellent. And how do you deal with cars that are different from regular cars that you work with? You just have to do a little bit more research. The information is out there. Right, you just have to do your research. We have a lot of uh, subscription services that we we have at our shop that you can find the information you need. I mean, at the end of the day, they all kind of work the same. It's just some of them have different tweaks and different wiring. So you just have to do the research. But when it comes right down to it, all cars that run on gas pretty well work the same. Just all different sizes and shapes and configurations. That's right. <laughs> Excellent. Rena, we missed yeah. one question. So there's oh, one question. One? Which one? From Middle Hill Region School. What's that one? Where did you go to school? From the Middle oh. Hill Regional School? Yeah. Where did I go to school? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> like right from when I was a kid? Yeah. <laughs> well, you went to Parkview, well, I assume. No, I went to Bridgewater High. Okay, right. Yeah, Bridgewater High School. Then I went to the Royal Military College in Kingston. Then I went to Queen's University. And then I went to NSCC in Bridgewater for business. And then I did the apprenticeship program for automotive. Excellent. I think that kind of wraps us up. Um, I don't see any more questions. If we do get any more questions, Jason, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll email you with them and we'll get some answers back for people. But Thank you so much for joining us. Um, my pleasure. I, I do need to soon make an appointment and get my snow tires on. It's getting on that time of year. It is. It is. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Jason. We'll let it was you know. My pleasure. Now. I know how busy you are. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Bye bye now. Bye. Hello, everyone. I give you a, just a second or so to get ready again. We're going to get started. I hope everybody has been enjoying the morning so far. I think we've heard from three excellent mentors so far. Um, and we do have our fourth mentor here and ready to get started. Um, so uh, Steve, if you wanna put your video on, you can do that just so we, I did see you log in. There he is, Steven. Um, How's it going? So it's going good. You can hear us and we can hear you. So that's the key to all of this. Perfect. Uh, excellent. So. Steven Benson, um, this is kind of a really cool uh, mentor that we've got a little bit different. He is a rope technician. And I don't know a lot about what that means, but he's going to explain it all to us. So Steve, Steven, um, do you want to get going? And uh, do you want me to ask you questions or do you want to just do your thing? Uh, let's start with some questions. All right, let's start with some questions. So first, why don't you just tell everybody a little bit about what it is you do? Okay. <laughs> um, so rope access or being a rope te technician, I guess, uh, explaining it's probably the hardest part of the job. Um, the easiest way I can kind of think of would be we're working at height specialists. So we use equipment very similar to mount climbing, caving, that sort of stuff, just a little beefier to access all sorts of work areas from industrial refineries, underneath bridges, wind turbines, high-rise buildings, all that sort of stuff um, to do everything from inspection work to all of the trades. We do electrical work, pipe fitting, welding, any of that stuff. So if anyone is looking to get into any of those, this is an amazing little trade to get into to kind of build off that as well. Excellent. Um, so what made you choose this career? 
<laughs> um, honestly, I'd never heard of it until I was at a barbecue with a friend and one of his friends came in as they do and offered me a job just helping out. Uh, I went away for a small two week job and then he got me on the course after that and kind of never went back. It was, uh, you know, four days of training and then I passed the assessment on Friday and I was in Fort McMurray on Monday and I was there for years after that. Wow. Um, so what education do you need for this role then? Uh, the education itself, there isn't any requirements to get into rope access. You just need to be 18. I know some companies will say minimum high school diploma, all that sort of good stuff, um, which obviously I'd recommend. Uh, <laughs> Uh, after that, it. <laughs> it's just the training for the course itself. So to get in at the start, it's a minimum of a four-day course. Uh, we here at Celtic Falcon, we teach it in five days just to give everyone a little extra time. And then you do an assessment after that. So an assessor that works for the uh, IRATA organization, I guess, would come in, make sure that everybody can climb around safely, do that. And then that's how they get started. So I guess you can't have a fear of heights. No, it doesn't help. Uh, I've got a little one. That's why I like to teach now. So this keeps me nice and close to the ground and out of the cold. All right. So what does a typical work day look like for a rope technician? Um, so I'll get into mine after, I guess. Obviously now I'm teaching, it's a little different. When I was working at Fort McMurray, there was a lot of staying at camps. So you would be out there for, uh, when I started, it was, you know, month on, week off, which was a little ridiculous. Then it kind of steadies out to a two weeks on, two weeks off rotation, which is pretty standard in the industry now. Um, when you're at the camps, generally it's you get up early, you're on a bus at like 6, 6.30, go to site. Um, to be honest, I haven't been out there since all the COVID stuff. I hear it's been a nightmare getting on with all of that stuff, but it's all still going ahead. Everyone's still busy. Um, but then a bunch of safety meetings, drive out to a site location, and then where my job would come into place is finding out what the job is. And then I would have to rig up ropes, get people, get these trades people into a location so that they can fix whatever they need to, whether it's a busted pipe, everything from changing a light bulb to who knows, whatever they need us to do. And then, you know, standard lunch breaks, all that sort of good stuff. Your average days, normally 10 or 12 hours when you're out on those industrial sites. And then, yeah, back on a bus, back to camp. But that's just that side of it. There's also lots of work that happens in the city here. Guys come home every night after work, all that sort of good stuff as well. So what are some of the opportunities kind of right in the Maritimes rather than out west for people who aren't interested in that kind of rotation? Yeah. Sorry, you're a little quiet there. Oh, so what are some of the opportunities here in, in Nova Scotia or the Atlantic provinces, you know, for people who aren't interested in doing the rotational work? Yeah, for sure. So there's definitely less. Most of the guys that want full-time consistent work end up going out West just because that's where all the work is. But there, they are getting more and more out here. For some reason, it kind of started out this way. And then it's like everyone out here forgot about it. But um, at a lot of the like Irving refineries and stuff like that, there is still um, lots of work coming up. There's lots of uh, building maintenance work. There's a company called um, they are, uh, Clearview. They do a lot of window cleaning, that sort of stuff. So through the summer months, there's plenty of work like that. Um, as much as I love the trade, and I always recommend people having a look at it, finding that consistent work has always been a thing. So once I got into teaching, it was a nice little blessing. So that's why I always recommend getting another trade or any of that sort of stuff. So it helps if you can't fly away or if you're not willing to, it's nice not to get stuck in those jobs where you've got to kind of fly away. Right. Yeah. Um, so what's the most challenging part of your job? Uh, when I was on the operational side of it, so kind of working these jobs, I would say the first one would be the exposure. So if you're not comfortable being at height or in a galing wind, sort of hanging off the side of something, it can be a little intimidating after that, um, just travel. And then the, the weather, obviously, if you're working in, even here in the winter, working out in Northern uh, Alberta, minus 40 sort of stuff, trying to get anything done is a little tr trouble. But yeah. Um, yeah, other than that, it's all pretty fun. So, so how much can people expect to make money-wise? Yeah, for sure. So 
the starting rate when I started, I, I did a four day course, did the assessment, and then I flew straight out to a refinery and the company was paying my flights. They were paying um, per diems and stuff while you were traveling. And I started at 25 an hour. Um, the, the minimum I've sort of heard for level one and uh, generally like doing building maintenance stuff would be probably 20. Um, and then it's up from there as the industry itself. It's, it is, it's not a recognized trade like pipe fitting or electrical or any of that sort of stuff, but it's structured very similar. So we have three levels, one, two, and three. Um, I'd say level one sort of average 20 to 25, 30 at most, I'd say, um, level twos would be your sort of 30 to 35, 40. And then I know guys as level threes with trades making upwards of 75, $80 an hour. Um, if you, if you're willing to go out and do those sort of refinery jobs, stuff like that. Right. And so what's the difference between a level one, two, and three? Is it extra height? Is it extra um, training? Uh, I'd say training and responsibility, yeah. So as a level one, if you come in and do the course where I'm working now at uh, Celtic Falcon, um, the first course we teach to get your level one is mostly just access. We teach people how to climb around ropes so they can get from A to B. We teach them how to climb different structures. And then a very simple sort of rescue, just in case they, they happen to be working next to their friend, they cut their hand, that sort of thing. Um, as the apprenticeship goes, you'll do that five-day course. And then if you want to level up to two, you need to get a thousand hours and a full year. So you've got to wait a full year, get a thousand hours, then come back to another uh, five days of training. And that level two is a big jump. You do a lot more. Um, of actually setting up the ropes. So you need to know how to get these people into location, things like that. And then a lot more rescue. So basically anywhere someone manages to get themselves stuck, we need to be able to get them out of there. And then same again, another year, another thousand hours, best case. Then you can come back, get your level three. And then there's a few more rescues and then a lot of job planning, um, responsibility sort of stuff. So you need to be able to plan a job from start to finish how to get people into a location, make sure before anyone leaves the ground, we have a rescue plan for them, all that sort of stuff. Excellent. All right. Um, so I, I, I'm, I, I'm kind of learning about this trade for the first time myself right now. So I'm thinking that if you are a welder or if you are an electrician and you're really interested in kind of even adding to your pay scale even more, yep. then getting this course gives you opportunities to do work that nobody else can do as a welder. Absolutely. A, a lot of the training, when, it, when I was living out in Alberta, a lot of the training I did out there for a different company was um, a lot of the union trades people looking for extra work, something, just another ticket to help get to that extra job. And as you can imagine, there's only so many people willing to do it, let alone able to do it. So um, if, if, you are interested in the trade side of work, then it's a, it's a massive um, boost sort of thing yeah. to the resume. So is there an opportunity if you don't have a trade to only be a rope technician? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's getting harder and harder. Obviously the more it's being recognized, the more these big sites are requiring um, like certified trades people, I guess, but I never had a trade getting into it. I started out and just worked hard and met the right people and kind of got a foot in the door made myself the annoying guy on site. So I was always there. Um, and then obviously without getting a trade, I made a decision to get into the teaching side of it. So now I'm over here, at, uh, as I said, Celtic Falcon there and I teach full time now. So all that without a trade, I've, I've been in it for eight or nine years now. Um, so were you going to show us a little bit today on your video? I know Nicola had mentioned you were going to I, I can turn around. the camera around here. I figured that out on the last one. Give you a quick look. So I'm in the training center now. Um, it's kind of hard to see what's going on here, but as you can see, there's just ropes kind of hanging off the roof and everything like that. And what we teach straight out the gate is just how to climb up and down a couple of these ropes, and then go from one set of ropes to the next, um, things like that. And there's the dog. And there's the dog. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so I, I, I guess I'm kind of wondering about 
you know, what is the demand, right? Like you talked about having um, the, uh, the the wind turbines. I mean, Nova yep. Scotia is full of wind turbines now. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the demand as a level one without a trade isn't great. I'm not going to go telling everybody to run out and get it and expect to get a job the next day. But it's one of those, once you've got it, if you can be annoying enough, get out enough resumes, get a foot in the door somewhere. Once you can get onto a site, these companies are pretty good at keeping people busy. Um, I don't know a lot of rope technicians that are sitting around looking for work sort of thing. If they're good at their job, obviously. Um, yeah. one, once you get your level two, then it becomes a lot easier because then the, your trade itself is actually rigging the ropes and being able to rescue. So as a level one, it's basically your job to get out there and help, get those hours, get that experience so that you can level up. But if you wanted to um, go work in the city here, cleaning windows, doing building maintenance, stuff like that. Um, I was on a job in the summer here just replacing windows on one of the apartment buildings. Little things like that. So there's no need for a trade doing any of that sort of stuff. And we stayed nice and busy for the summer. Excellent. Um, I'm trying to think. So education-wise, you're saying high school diploma minimum to get started, but having a trade is a huge bonus. For sure. Um, yeah, not even a high school diploma. You just need to be 18 to do the course. Oh, I actually okay. didn't have my high school diploma when I started. I had to go back and get it. So so, so you've since done it. All right. Um, is there any extra training or experience that would be beneficial for students? Um, just work experience in general. I know what helped me a lot was I started in trade work. Young, everything from bricklaying, carpentry, all that sort of stuff. And everything we do is some sort of hands-on job. So even if you're just there without a trade helping people, knowing what a screwdriver is and how to use it kind of goes a long way. So having a bit of hands-on experience, um, it's always tricky when you see people come from, say, an office job, then want to do a change into this, and they're like, oh, wow, this is how we use all this stuff. So there's always a bit of a learning curve there. But any sort of, um, yeah, just general uh, construction experience is always a good help. But nothing, I, I wouldn't recommend going out and paying for any extra training or anything like that. Uh, it's kind of one of those learn on the job trades, I guess. Yeah. So if you were into mountain climbing, let's say, this would be a natural for you. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. A lot of, I'd say, geez, it's got to be at least half of the people I've ever worked with are all massive mountain climbers, go sleeping on the side of cliffs and doing all sorts of weird stuff. <laughs> Again, not for me. I'm not a huge fan of heights, but they seem to have a ball. Um, yeah. But exactly that. It's very similar equipment, things like that. I think it's hilarious that you have a bit of a fear of heights and you're a rope technician. Yes. As, as I said, I didn't know exactly what it was when I got into it. And then I kind of made a job out of it. So I'm stuck here now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. If anybody has any questions, once again, you're welcome to put them in chat. We've got a couple of minutes left for questions now for Steve. Um, so feel free to put on your mic or type it in the chat and we'll get it uh get it to Steve to answer. It's, it's such a unique kind of uh, opportunity that, you know, that most people don't even hear about. Yeah, absolutely. And as I said, I'd never heard of this before I got into it. And a big thing with this ticket is it's uh, international. I think it's recognized in at least 60 uh, countries now. So if I ever want to go back to Australia, I can go pick up a job. No problem there. All sorts of stuff. Um, I know guys that have worked all over the world doing this stuff. And it really, like, if you're, especially these guys getting into it young, um, I know plenty of guys and girls that have traveled the world just by doing this. They'll go take a job somewhere weird in Europe, go work that, and then travel around a bunch. Um, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of opportunity like that. Excellent. And that's kind of an interesting piece. What would you say is the, the ratio of male to female rope climbers? Um definitely male heavy i think we just had uh one of our other trainers here actually skylar she just got her level three she's been helping me uh teach here ever since i started um i think ah oh, what is it i wrote it down the other day ah oh, it's gonna kill me i'm not i'm not gonna get it off the top of my head but there's um it's definitely male heavy but it's starting to swing the other way obviously just like everything else these days everyone's trying to catch up and realize that there's no reason you know, women can't be doing all this stuff. And some of the best level threes I've worked with were women. Um, I think for a long time, it was just 
trades guys in dirty industrial settings and I don't want to be there, let alone, you know, so, but it's yeah. definitely coming back the other way. If there is, there are any women here looking to get into it, it's, it's a huge, and they have an amazing little community in it as well. They've got their own um, Facebook group. A friend of mine runs it and they're on there all helping each other out. All those little things like where do you find gloves that work, that fit, harnesses that fit, all that sort of stuff that just is different that we don't think about. Right. Yep. No, that's, that's, those are good points, right? You know, even the gloves, I mean, huge gloves for most guys and much smaller ones for many females. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I do have a question in the chat. How many hours per week on average would someone in this trade work? Oof. Putting an average on it's tricky. Um, when, when I was out West on site, I was working 70 to 80 hours a week. And I'd be out there for two weeks and I would do that. And then I'd come home and have two weeks off. Um, when you're out on those sort of big jobs or most big jobs, you're generally working 10 hour days and then it's whatever rotation you need until the job's done. Um, I also know, I know guys that work at refineries that work, you know, 40, 50 hour weeks. Um, me teaching, I teach a course, you know, 40 to 50 hours one week and then I'll do a few hours cleaning up the shop the next week, stuff like that. Um, yeah, it's, it, it varies ridiculously really depending on the, on the job. job and everything else going on. Yeah. And I suppose like if you're a welder per se, much of your work might not be also climbing. You might be working on things on the ground most of the time, but at least you have that ability to be able to climb to fix a wind turbine or something if you need to. Absolutely. So for the longest time, most of the rope companies on these sites being a relatively new industry weren't allowed to do work on the ground just people arguing over contracts and stuff like that. But a lot of the companies now, if they don't have anything up in the air, they're down on the ground working as well. Or, you know, if you get lucky, you're sitting around waiting for something when it's cold. Right. Okay. A couple more questions in the chat. Yeah. How many students per course in your program and how much does it cost? Uh, we run eight man courses. So that's the uh, most me and my uh, partner here are allowed to teach. And then the assessors, when they come in, on the Saturday, they're only allowed to assess for eight people. So we sometimes run a bigger course, but then we have to run multiple assessments. Um, the course, I should know that. I work here. Um, <laughs> I think it's just over two grand for the course, which is steep. Um, two, it might be 2,400 off the top of my head. I'm not too sure, to be honest. Okay. Um, but again, it's... For me, uh, a lot of companies, once you do the initial course, you can get companies to uh, help pay for these things. Um, and it is a course that needs to be uh, recertified every three years as well. So um, obviously helps keep us busy as instructors, but um, a lot of the companies will help their uh, workers out paying for all that sort of stuff. So do you just kind of redo your level one every three years or whatever level you're at? Yeah, so if you don't, manage to gain enough hours to go up to the next level, then people will recertify at the, uh, the level they're at, keep building those hours and then come back and try and level up generally. But I know some guys um, that are tradespeople, insulators, for example, that are just career level ones. They just use this as a way to get to their job. They're, you know, they're tradespeople that do rope access on the site sort of thing. And I know plenty of other people that got trades just so they could get lots of hours doing rope access. And then the minute they got their level three, they never picked up a tool again. <laughs> so lots of different ways to do this. Well, I Absolutely. think that's, that's kind of our time for you this morning. Thank you so much for, for sure. joining no, us. Thank you guys. Uh, you know, this is such a unique kind of uh, uh, opportunity and, and, you know, a trade on its own or a trade to help with other ones. Um, one of them would like to see the dog again, if they could. <laughs> hey, Frank. Come here. Oh, here he is. And this is probably the biggest perk of my job. Oh, uh, having a big, a big scratch. Boy. There you go. Come here, yeah. cranky old man. <laughs> there he is. I get to bring him to work every day, which is great. Look at that. <laughs> Look at that. Perfect. There's the dog. The dogs always steal the show. Yeah, always helps. Everybody likes coming to a course when there's a dog in the training center. I've got one sleeping right over here beside yeah. me. So luckily she's see, keeping quiet, not, uh, not, not bugging too much this morning. Perfect. 
Thank you so much, Steve. It was so oh, interesting excellent. to hear about that. That is amazing. Um, I'll let you go now. And I, I don't know what you're going to go do. Go, go climb something or something. Oh, for sure. All right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye. All right, everyone. That was amazing. I think those were all excellent presenters this morning. Um, certainly some good ideas there for different trades. A lot of the same kind of information because, you know, trades, a lot of it's that apprenticeship um, and, you know, whether or not you uh, do some NSCC with it or just do an apprenticeship, lots of opportunities there. Um, if anybody has any questions, we will go back to the mentors to answer questions if you've come up with some more. So just put them in the chat or the teachers can email Nicola after the event as well. Um, so the next part of what we're going to do today, um, first, I just want to mention a little bit about our digital campus. And I'm, I'm kind of talking to the students specifically when I'm talking about this, because the JA digital campus has a lot of different um, uh, self-directed programming that you could do if you wanted to. Um, basically, there's ones around financial literacy. There's some around entrepreneurship. And then there's also another one called E-Trades that you might be interested in taking a look at. It gives you a chance to figure out, like if you're thinking about a trade and you wanna work for yourself, um, like we saw that Joey did, you need some of the business side of it as well. So E-Trades gives you an opportunity to think about what you need to know if you wanna work for yourself in one of the trades. So all of those programs are at, and I'll get um, Vishaka to write this in the, in the, the uh, chat, it's at www.jacampus.org. So that's a place that you can go and check out some of the courses that are there. There's some to teach you about financial literacy. There's some that are just for fun. Um, and then there's some entrepreneurial ones there as well. So if you're interested, feel free to check out the campus. It's free to use um, for all the students and you can track it. Um, you can print yourself certificates when you finish courses. So it can be a really good place to go. Um, there's also some coding there. So if you're interested in learning some coding, um, you can get in through the JA campus to code.org and do programming there as well. So the next piece of what we're going to do today um, is kind of new for us. We're really excited to be able to do this today. Uh, and I think I'm going to share my screen if this works. I'm going to bring this up and I'm going to share a window and it doesn't seem to be showing up on my options. I know I have it open. And I'm just, there we go. So this is what I want to share. Oh, there it is. All right. So I need to start the slideshow from the beginning and then I'm going to share this screen. Here we go. So what we're going to do here is um, the World of Choices, we're going to do an expo today. And what's kind of neat about this is there's a lot of different um, what we're calling booths or breakout rooms that you'll be able to go into to learn more about different um, organizations and the different types of jobs or careers that they have available. Now, a lot of your classes are going to be joining us each week. And so some of these presenters will be there uh, multiple weeks, so you'll get a chance to visit different ones. But for today, we'd like you to visit just one booth. And you're either going to do that as a whole class or you're going to do it individually, but that's up to your teacher as to whether or not you're going to join individually or as a class. And you'll get a chance to um, kind of learn about some of the ones here. So if we take a look, for instance, at IBM, so IBM is a company with a rich history of contributing to world changing progress. So they have a lot to do. They're a leader in technology and how that is going to evolve and be part of the future. So today IBM um, helps industries in 170 countries around the world and they're ushering in the transformation, transformation of the world's biggest businesses to a digital era through artificial intelligence, quantum blockchain, cloud computing, and services. 
So there's a lot of different careers there, and that might be one of the ones that you want to go visit today as a class. The next one that you could go visit is RBC. So RBC, of course, is one of the Canada's biggest job banks um, and largest banks, not job banks, and they have 86,000 full-time people around the world, um, around Canada, and they're creating this positive social impact and integrating business as part of the culture. And so there's a lot of different careers there as well, from client advisors to mortgage specialists to branch managers, business analysts, lots of different careers there as well. Um, the Nova Scotia Health Authority is going to be here today as well. And obviously the Nova Scotia Health Authority is, um, it's all of our hospitals, it's all of the health care that we have here in Nova Scotia. And there's a lot of different jobs there as well, including registered nurse, medical technology, physiotherapist, um, power engineer. They have so many different careers at Nova Scotia Health Authority. We also have somebody from the Canadian Army Reserve, and they're here to tell you about a lot of the different um, careers. Today, they'll focus a lot on the trades types that they have. So whether it's a soldier, an engineer, administrator, some technicians, but there's a lot of information there on a variety of trades within the military. Nova Scotia Power is another huge employer here in Nova Scotia. And so they provide 95% of the electrical um, that Nova Scotians use. They have a huge um, uh, uh, workforce and they manage over $4.1 billion in generation, transmission, and distribution of our power. And they do that through coal and oil and tidal and um, you know, all kinds of different ways. So a lot of cool careers there as well. Paraline technicians, engineers, mechanics, specialists, safety specialists, a lot of IT there as well. So you may want to talk to them today and ask some questions about what they have to offer. NSCC is here today as well. Um, you could talk to them about some of the different trades that they have available and programs that they have available um, and what you might need to get into those trades if there's waiting lists. So an opportunity to get some information from NSCC today about what they're offering. And um, Nova Scotia is the other one. So the, um, oh, is this the one that's not here, Sashaka? I'm not, they're not here today, right? Right. So they weren't able to actually come today. So we have six booths that are going to be open for you to go to today. Um, and what we're going to do is I'm going to put up a slide for you that has a QR code. Um, and Vishaka, are you going to put the link in for the teachers to go? So we can head over. Yes. We're going to have a few minutes for you to go there, go into a breakout room, and decide which one as a class or if you're going individually. I'm going to put a QR code up. So if you're going individually, you can go to the QR code. Um, if you're doing it as a class, the teacher can connect to the Zoom link. So we are going to use Zoom for this particular one. So QR code is right there if you're scanning that um, to go on your own or you can use the link in the chat to go and then go find the right booth. Thank you so much for participating. We're going to close this chat in about a minute and then we'll see you over in the trades or in the trades expo. Oh, and we're going to stop recording, Vishaka.